right san joaquin valley transparency thank you guys for coming back to my channel make sure you subscribe hit the like button and all that good stuff so in my last video i promised you guys that i would do some research regarding qualified immunity what is it what i learned is quite sinister and very alarming to say the least before we get into this i want to mention to you guys really quick that i have a college degree in business accounting i did study law but that was only business law the reason I bring this up to you right now is because from all of the courses that I took, the good grades I received, the dean's list that I made, the degree that I got from the schooling, from graduating, I realized that I had what it took to do some research, do my assignments, and to get the assignments completed. That's what I'm doing here. Sorry I've procrastinated for such a long time, guys, to bring you what I'm truly capable of doing. We're about to show you guys a clip that will break down we're going to analyze we're going to go over it with the fine tooth comb and we're going to try to interpret it in a way that we can all understand after the clip and after the evaluation we'll get right into what qualified immunity is and how it doesn't work without further ado let's watch this clip and get ready to get educated we're going to be here we're going to be here a while so i'm going to ask you to remove your camera off of that you're what? free to videotape yeah. but you're not free to impede anything not so impeding anything. Not impeding anything. If you show me a Florida State statute that says that I can't set my camera equipment down for a second. No, no, here you can. Yes, no. I can. This is my desk. Right, put it down. That's my desk. Right, put it down. So this is the moment that I believe that the deputy loses his qualified immunity. For one, he's not supposed to grab anything that's not his. Secondly, he enticed him. He told him, come on, set it down, which to me is a form of entrapment. I may be wrong, but nevertheless, that's we know what our rights are and how they, they are being constantly violated every day. But we have to understand that the judges, they're always going to make their judgment calls on how they feel about this. And when I, when I show you guys a little bit about how qualified immunity came about, you guys are going to be very angry. Keep watching the rest of the video and we'll get into that soon. All right, put it down. That's my dad. All right, put it down. I really like how Wright's Crispy, the guy recording, put it up there that he's legally snatched his camera back. When you guys hear what he tells the deputy, it just blows my mind because I have a feeling that they do know exactly what qualified immunity is. They're taught about qualified immunity, but they're not taught about well-established law. What does that mean? We'll find out. Now, now you have a civil lawsuit on your hands. You have a civil lawsuit. You don't have qualified immunity. You know that, right? You don't have qualified immunity, pal. You have a jet ski or a pension? Say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. 11th Circuit Court. Get ready to get subpoenaed. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do not, no. Oh, okay. Well, do you know what qualified immunity is? I do not. The city is not going to pay for your mistakes today. Okay. You are. Okay. Out of your own pocket. Um, um, which is actually pocket. my pocket. Short pocket. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed, abolishing segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws. And in 1967, some gentlemen were arrested who were in front of a whites only cafe or restaurant or coffee shop or whatnot lieutenant ray was called out there the segregation laws were over but yet they arrested these guys and they convicted them these guys ended up winning later on cases were overturned and they took it to the supreme court in the supreme court they explained how exactly the judge and the officers were wrong in what they did and he was looking for compensation or whatnot and the judge he gave them qualified immunity, and that's where we're at today. I'm going to include a, a few clips of that court case. Pay attention. We're going to get more into what we're talking about and why qualified immunity doesn't work. They arrived quietly in taxi cabs. There were two police waiting on the back ramp of the bus station. The police went around the back way and met the priest as they walked through the main entrance of the bus station passed a police stanchion right in front of the entrance to the bus station which said white only by order of the police as they went into the door of the bus station father jones one of the petitioners here uh, heard one of the officers say shall we get them now or shall we wait till later in any event 
the, 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 there were 15 priests in this group, four of whom are petitioners here, walked through the entrance and started toward the coffee shop a few feet inside the bus station. A few of them, of the 15, did actually get into the coffee shop, but at that point, one of the two police officers, either Officer Nichols or Officer Griffith, Griffiths, two of the respondents here, uh, halted them and made them come, those that come in the bus station come back, and they halted the whole group and, they, and were told to move on. At this point, one of the priests said, uh, we are on our way to, to Chattanooga, we have tickets and we wanted to, it'd be a long trip, we wanted to have uh, coffee or sandwich or something. What's going on in this court case actually reminds me of the black man that was arrested for eating a sandwich on the BART station. Does, am I the only one? Anyways, keep paying attention guys, this is really important. Before we uh, take off on our trip, no com the police officer said move on, with no moving on, they were arrested. And, and not being told, and the record doesn't reflect why they were being arrested at that point, or what they were being arrested for, or why they were told to move on. But in any event, a few moments later, the respondent Ray, the deputy chief of police of Jackson, Mississippi, and at that time a captain of the police, came in the station and immediately walked up to these people and told them to move on not seeking information from the other police officers, they were already under arrest. In any event, uh, the comedy went on and he told them to move on and they repeated the same thing. They wanted to uh, have a sandwich before they took off at Chattanooga. And he, at that point, not, not moving on, he also arrested them and they were then taken off in the traditional Jackson paddy wagon to uh, the jail and where they stayed two days later when the case was then tried before Magistrate Spencer, who convicted them and sentenced them to the maximum sentence of four months in jail for the offense that they committed, as well as a fine which was put upon them. Uh, all the petitioners here remained in jail for at least seven, and Father Jones, I think, something like 17 or 18 days, the reason being that bail was coming from various communities to help bail them out and took at least seven days to get bail and, and more for Father Jones. In any event, after they all were released, they went on to the convention, they appealed the case. And they, in Mississippi, the first uh, appellate procedure is this de novo trial. And at the de novo trial of Father Jones, the first one tried, after the, after the prosecution's case was in, motion was made to dismiss, and the judge presiding at that uh, level dismissed the case on the grounds there was no showing of a violation of the statute. That the judge, so far as the judge is concerned, convicted and deprived the petitioners of rights, privileges, immunities, etc., for the sole purpose of enforcing the segregation laws, customs, policies, and usages of the state of Mississippi. You contend that that's corrupt? I would contend that that is a, what is considered to be a violation, what we consider to be a violation of the statute, deliberately imprisoning someone with, without any evidence in the record, and it's that is not fact supported by that quotation, is it, that you just read? I'm sorry, sir. It's not supported by the quotation that you just read. Your position is not supported by the quotation that you I just would not, read. I would not accept that, Your Honor. Uh, That's what I'd like to know. Just well, I would you say that... Square your position with that. Let me get back to my quotation. But Senator Trumbull has said here, first of all, because if he acted innocently, the judge would not be punished. And we don't dispute it. We accept that, of course. And Your that problem is, is what is innocent. What is innocent. But we also said, if he acts corruptly or viciously, now I am not, an ex I don't, viciously is not a word of art. It's common parlance. But I would certainly think that that would apply to a judge who, without evidence, convicted and incarcerated people knowing there was no evidence. And this is based upon not only what I say about the case and what the complaint says about the case, but the fact that on the first appellate level, the judge who tried the case dis dismissed on the prosecution's evidence because he said there was no evidence to show a violation of the statute that they were convicted because that sign outside the bus station said that anyone who went to that bus station who was Negro uh, was in violation of the law because that sign said white only by order of the police. Now, it's hard to conceive of what that means except in terms of 
uh, anyone other than a white person who enters or who whites and Negroes who enter together are in violation, and that's why they're arrested, because the testimony of the police here says these, these uh, petitioners did absolutely no act which could be remotely considered wrong. And unlike the Adelaide case, these people had a right to be here. Sound familiar, anyone? So this type of thing is actually still happening today. People are getting arrested for things that are not even illegal, and they're getting convicted. But in the eyes of the law, it says that it's okay if an officer arrests you for something that you didn't do as long as he did it in good faith. That's what qualified immunity means. How does that work? Leave some comments. Let me know what you think. Keep watching. This is important. There was no question they have a right to be in a, private, in a, in a bus station quietly and peacefully with tickets in their hands about to go off to Chattanooga. I mean, whatever, the, the, whatever the merits of an Adelie type of situation, they don't apply here at all because these people had a public right to be there. And they were asked to leave, not for anything they did, but because that sign outside the, the door of the uh, uh, station did not permit them to enter the station. He had jurisdiction. The judge had jurisdiction, did he not? It, yes, there's no question. He was, he was, they were charged under a Mississippi statute, disorderly conduct statute. So that, in that sense, he, they, he had jurisdiction, of course. There's no question about it. But uh, we, uh, we think that the intent of the Congress of 1871, from reading the, the, the Congressional Globe at that time, is so carefully drawn against the sham justice that was per 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 perpetrated in the period from 1866 through the period of 1871, that the very kind of conduct that is concerned in this case is the kind of conduct the 1871 Congress was concerned about. They were concerned about the phony justice, the sham justice, the, the, the police who arrest and the judges who convict when there is no evidence of any, any, any wrongdoing. If you're still here, that means you're here to learn. I truly appreciate you. Thank you guys so much. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, go ahead and do so now. Share this video with everybody you know. It's important that this message gets out. This is my first part to my qualified immunity series. I'm going to try to educate myself and learn more about this and why it doesn't work. And does it work? I don't know. I don't think so. It doesn't seem like it. The case should be outraging everyone. This, there's more, there's a lot more to it. We're going to cover it all. I'm going to get into it. Thank you guys for tuning in. Watch the rest of this, these clips. The original video is an hour long. I'm going to put the link in the description so you guys can go watch it. Here are some important parts of that video that I cut out for you guys. Watch the rest of this. Be ready for part two. Stay tuned. Subscribe. Share this video with everyone. Somebody please reach out to Colin Kaepernick and all these guys that are out there doing something. Let them know what I'm doing. I think this is important. I think if they jumped on board, I think they could make a difference. We need your guys' big voices out there. Don't just say that there's a problem and not offer a solution. Thank you, guys. I'll see you guys soon. Part two. Watch the rest of this. The, the distinction that we draw, and we think that, the, that Senator Trumbull draws that distinction perhaps better than we can, but we just think the distinction is that when a judge does it knowingly to perpetuate an illegal custom such as segregation, then he would be liable. But if he makes a mere error of judgment or is unacquainted with the law, that would not be any violation of 1983. We're not questioning his right to continue to make errors of judgment. We, can t we do question the right to sit, for example, to take a, a, a case which I think <clears throat> might lay out the situation. We do question the right of a judge to meet with hoodlums the night before he knows he's going to cake, have a try a case and, and tell the hoodlums, okay, fellas, I'm going to give the, throw, the, throw the book at these guys tomorrow morning when I try them. That's the kind of case we're talking about. And the, and the decision of the Fifth Circuit and of the other circuits, if upheld, do not permit 1983 to cover a judge under those circumstances. Now, just briefly, every case that has come since Tenney against Brandau, even though Tenney was a state legislator case, every case that has been decided by the circuit courts, and there have been several uh, since then, have decided solely on the basis of Tenney. Even though Tenney refers to a state legislator, those cases which refer to judges are given the decision uh, in the same manner as, as, as if they have the application to the Tenney, Tenney doctrine. But Tenney has, in a sense, if you permit me to say so, led the courts astray by an improper analysis of the, of the, of the statutes of 1871-1866. It is, uh, it is our position that if Tenney 
had been decided on the basis of the legislative history and the analysis of the words of the statute, the other courts would not have made the mistake. As a matter of fact, Judge Magruder of the First Circuit in, in Francis against uh, Crafts, which has been referred to by the court below and by our worthy opponents, is a typical case where Judge Magruder in that decision says the statute is very broad. And I am very grateful that the Supreme Court has decided Tenney against Brandhoff because, in effect, it takes me off the hook. And that, this is precisely what, uh, what Judge, Judge Magruder, who is a very fine judge, has said in a, in, in a case involving a judge in Massachusetts. Reflected by your complaint, as I read it, your complaint does not even allege any motive. Well, it does to this extent. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted. It does not relate, uh, allege any motive on the part of the judge. Well, it says that these people were uh, convicted uh, in violation of their civil rights for the sole purpose of enforcing segregation laws. You don't have any allegation in here about corruption or corrupt motives or a vicious purpose or anything of the sort. Well, I Is that right? Think, I'm sorry, I would think that. When, when some, if a judge convicts somebody for the sole purpose of enforcing a segregation law or custom, that spells out the Mr. violation. You allege here that, they, that a state judge convicted a person for the sole purpose of enforcing the segregation laws, customs, policies, and usages of, of the state of Mississippi. That's right. And usually state judges <coughs> are supposed to do that unless there's a supervening uh, federal uh, law. Well, they, 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 they were convicted under the color of a state law, that is, the disorderly conduct statute of the state, but not because there was any evidence showing a violation of the state statute, but solely for the purpose of, in, of convicting and incarcerating these people because the state intended to uphold the segregation, that is, the <coughs> judge intended to uphold the segregation laws of the state. I had the violence in Alabama just two months before, that just a month before this occurred, there had been freedom riders in, in Jackson, and they had uh, caused almost violence at that time. They came down in a grove to the grove to the in taxis to the bus station and went in. Now they, the opposing counsel has not given you the testimony on the other side. They went in and thirty. There is testimony that thirty to forty people followed them in. That they had angry expressions, that they were muttering, and that they followed them into the bus station. These uh, this group of churchmen turned in to the left and started towards the restaurant and the police two just beat policemen on the street told them to move on they turned back and instead of moving blocked the stairway in the bus station stood in this narrow hall and uh, something the jury didn't need to be told was that that bus station is a very small room and proceeded to recite the Lord's Prayer there was a crowd not only had 30 or 40 followed them in but they had, uh, uh, there was a crowd in the station. There was muttering, mumbling, wrongful, uh, 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 violent gestures until all three, Mr. Ray and the other two policemen, testified emphatically that they thought that violence was about to ensue and that it would ensue if they did not arrest them. Now, this is not a criminal case on which the criminal convictions would, uh, would be involved. I court to give this case serious consideration because of its importance in the future litigation of thousands of cases in the federal court and on the effect it will have on our police force all over the country if they are subject to suit and subject to money damages with little pay and families and if they are subject to, fund, uh, to, to suits for damages. It can have a disastrous effect on the protection of the public. Mrs. Grayson, may I ask this as last question? Yes, sir. Are you asking us to reconsider Monroe and Pace? Oh, no, sir. I say it, I, my position is it has nothing to do with this case whatsoever. Well, the Court of Appeals relied heavily on Monroe and Pace. Yes, sir, and I think they thoroughly misunderstood it. It was a, a, a search and seizure case where probable cause had no, was no defense whatsoever. Well, as I, as I read their opinion, they rely on Monroe and Pate for saying that uh, good faith uh, is irrelevant. Yes. Uh, if, in they, fact, uh, they said the color in, of the state statute which they thought was valid. Uh, they, they said they, it's inherent in Monroe versus Pate that uh, they, uh, the good faith under a state statute, I'm talking about actions under 1983 only, yes, yes. Uh, was immaterial. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Monroe versus Pate didn't even deal with acting under a state statute in good faith, believing it was to be valid. There, they were acting without any, uh, contrary well, to well, the state statute. Well, then your answer to me is, uh, you don't want us to reconsider it, just to no, say that the Fifth Circuit misapplied. Misapplied it. It, had, it didn't have anything to do with acting under a state statute, which was later declared unconstitutional. They were acting without statute, beyond, contrary to the state statute. And by definition, the uh, search and seizure in Monroe against Pate could only be illegal if there was no probable cause. And there was therefore a finding when damages were found that there was no probable yes. cause. And that took that defense away, isn't that the point? Yes. Would you mind? Yes, it took it away. Excuse me. Took, yes, Mr. Would you mind telling me in a sentence just what is the question the state presents in its petition for such a vote? Well, the state is not here. Well, it's the, did, you mean I'm the sorry. petition? The one error of the court below in saying uh, that the probable cause is not a defense to false imprisonment under 1983. They said it was a defense under common law. Yes, uh, in other words, uh, if this is to go back to the trial against the officer, as I read the Court of Appeals, the only factual issue is going to be consent or invitation. Yes. Sir. And you suggest that uh, there has to be an addition or perhaps but they have the reversal and affirmance of the district court verdict on the ground that the issue of probable cause that, that, that will be a defense in the case and properly submitted to the jury. Yes, I, I would be submitted to a new jury if there is to be a new on, trial. On a new trial. Well, there, even under your uh, position, there has to be a new trial because there are errors of evidence. Well, I, we in our brief we have said that we thought the Fifth Circuit differed on. Uh, error erred in saying that those were errors in the evidence, but um, I have not had time to argue. See, they were just small matters of evidence. When I started doing these videos, I understood that there was a problem in government. I understood that there was a problem in policing. Why is there such a disconnect between citizens and law enforcement? The propaganda, we see it on TV. Um, whenever there's a situation, you see police without shame pretty much beg for more policing, more um, more leniency, more immunity, and we've basically give it to them. Shame on the news networks, shame on the propaganda that they spew on us, um, shame on all the garbage that they've presented to us so that we can truly believe that officers are heroes. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a cop, but not in the sense where I wanted to go violate people's rights. I wanted to stop crime. I wanted to do things like that. And I just went a different road. And I'm glad I did because I don't want to be one of those people who have a su superiority complex, the God complex, where I feel empowered over people. If you don't listen to me, I will arrest you, beat you up, whatnot. There's a reason why there's a disconnect between the people and government. We need to understand it more. We're not taught in school about laws. We're not taught anywhere about the system and government and how it works. Obviously, police are not taught on government and how it works either. They just make their best judgment in good faith, and that gives them qualified immunity. Well, basically anybody could do wrong and say, you know what, man, I did it in good faith. Sure, I did this crime over here, but I needed to feed my family. It was in good faith. Or whatever reason, you know, like it needed to be done for the betterment of, you know, my family, myself. I don't know. Like I said, this is all new to me. I'm sure it's new to a lot of you guys. There's a lot of people out there that are, you know, famous people that are taking knees and not um playing or not saluting the flag and you know there's a lot of disconnect there's black lives matter there's a bunch of groups out there um but i don't see anyone really offering a solution i knew that when i was starting to make these videos that i was going to do my best to offer solution one of the things that i'm bringing to the table is getting rid of qualified immunity um, police are not going to like it but in reality, I feel that we can actually change that mindset in the law enforcement community. I think that police, you guys, if you're a police officer and you're listening and watching this video, um, 
you guys should understand that you too should be held accountable. Imagine me sitting here saying to you guys, just because I created this channel from now on, everything that I do, I should not be held accountable because I'm doing everything in good faith. That that doesn't work, man. I just I will probably turn into a bad person. And that's probably what's happened to a lot of you guys. I've spoken to a retired police officer um, for many, many hours. And what I got from him, and he admitted basically um, what the uniform and the badge and the gun did to him. Um, it turns you into somebody that's not you personally. Um, you're, you stand beside yourself. You're not the person that your parents created anymore. You're not the good son that your mom wanted. You're not that son that your father was raising to become a hardworking man. Or were your parents police officers and all they care about is propaganda and do what you can to survive and come home that night. It doesn't matter if you make a mistake as long as you did it in good faith. No. America, everyone in America needs to be held to a higher standard. And we need to be held accountable for our mistakes. Me too. And you too. All of you, everyone, every single one of us, we should be held accountable for our mistakes. We don't want to confess to them, but yeah. And if you're a police officer, like I said, start thinking about this. How can we fix this world? How can we make it a better place? People are people in every area, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a mechanic, it doesn't matter. You're a fisherman and you're a police officer. There's good and bad in everything. But if we pretty much think and behave as if a police officer gets a badge and a gun and a uniform that he can do no wrong then that's giving that person the god complex and that person will turn into somebody that's not themselves and that's the disconnect between the people i hope i'm educating some of you guys um educate yourselves as i'm trying to do let's figure out this thing of qualified immunity and absolute immunity and this ancient immunity that our government, public officials have, I personally don't think it's working. Um, but I'm going to continue to do more research on this and present to you guys my findings. Thank you guys for tuning in. Be prepared for part two. This is only the beginning of what I'm trying to learn and educate on qualified immunity. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. And speak to someone. Share my videos. Share my channel. Subscribe. And you guys all re go reach out to these guys, man. Um, all these famous people that are out there doing things. Um, I would say Kaepernick. I would say um, a lot of people that are out there doing this. Somebody talk to Danny Trejo. There's, there's people that are out there that are famous and the, that want to be involved in, in how to make this country a better place. I'm seeing a lot of these guys on Instagram. I'm seeing... A lot of these people on on TV but what I don't see is a solution I say on my channel a lot of times that if everyone recorded police on the course of their duties then the practice of racism couldn't exist in the police force and even officers have heard me say that and they say wow that's good so like I said man let's keep this thing going this is part one be ready for part two stay tuned thank you